Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, we're getting set up here. Uh, I appreciate and want to thank the organizers for inviting us to speak today. And uh, my charge is I'm going to talk to you about Viasite and um, uh, give you, uh, take you through the technology and give you an update on our clinical trials and also related to both the physicians uh, as well as uh, the patients and the role that they're playing, currently playing, and what they've played in the course of the development of the product. So uh, just a, a high-level overview of what I'll talk about today. Uh, Viasite is focused on developing, our mission is to develop a, stem, uh, a, a cell therapy to treat either insulin-dependent uh, type 1 diabetics or insulin-requiring type 2 diabetics. Uh, the team is um, a rather accomplished team now. There's 65 people. We're based in La Jolla, California. And there's two major uh, platforms as far as technologies. One is the cells. That's a GMP cell source, which is derived from embryonic stem cells and a process to make pancreatic precursors. And then the second is a macro encapsulation te technology. And that's really to not only facilitate delivery and extraction, but also protect the cells from the immune system. Um, Brock just highlighted that uh, I ran a group in Johnson & Johnson, which Janssen is a part of J&J, for over 10 years. It, we had a similar mission, and we actually, J&J, had made an equity investment in Viasite. Um, I'll talk in more detail about that in a minute, but the bottom line is we merged the assets last fall, and I'll take you through that. The two products that we're developing, I'm going to talk about first Peck and Cap. Uh, that's really a product that is, has both the cell source and the device with the intent of a scalable cell source to protect the cells from the immune system. And the potential is really a functional cure. It's the first embryonic cell therapy in, in the clinic for diabetes, and I'll take you through that clinical trial. PEC Direct is a new product that we're developing, and, uh, and it, is a, um, it has the exact same cell source. A very similar device, but we've, we've, we've added some uh, perforations to the device that allows direct vascularization, and I'm gonna take you through that also. So first, a little background, and I think everybody here appreciates diabetes is a big issue, um, and, but the numbers are rather staggering, staggering. Over 415 million diabetics in the world as of last year, uh, based on I, the International Diabetes Federation data. And um, in 2030, that's gonna be close to over 500 million. About 20% of all diabetics take insulin. Uh, in the United States, we have about a million and a half type ones and about, a, about seven million type twos are taking insulin. And, and, and in 1921, insulin was discovered by Banting, Best, and McLeod. And since that time, we still treat this, the disease the same. We inject insulin to treat diabetics. Much better insulins, much better technologies, pumps, monitors. Uh, continuous glucose monitors, but at the end of the day, it's a degenerative process that ultimately results in all the, the terrible things on the end there, uh, kidney failure, heart failure, uh, amputations, and it's the leading cause of many of these things. And we feel that there's a, a, a large unmet need that can be met by a cell therapy. So, and this is a good segue to talk about physicians, because this is the Edmonton Protocol, and the one thing about the cell therapy and diabetes, we actually have a predicate clinical process which is not true for all cell therapies, but in this case, for almost 30 years, groups across the country, across the world, were trying to cure diabetes with cells. And, and it was the Edmonton group, led by James Shapiro, that first isolated islets um, and cheat. They changed the protocol with respect to the volume of cells as well as the immunosuppression drugs. And they demonstrated in, in 2000, they took seven patients that were hypo-unaware patients and they were insulin-free for a year. It changed the field, it was significant, and it was really clinicians over the course of 30 years that kept the faith. I mean, they were uh, doggedly working at this, and it was 30 years of failures and learnings that resulted in the process that we have today. So, and this, this just highlights just how significant it can be for a patient. This is a patient uh, prior to implantation. You can appreciate these wide excursions, that glycemic liability. That's ultimately what gives us all the, the downstream complications. And the A1C here is 8.9%. A normal A1C is 5.5%. A diabetic is over 6.5%. So you can appreciate this patient is really out of control. And after a transplant, their A1C, this patient's A1C is normalized and those glycemic uh, excursions are ameliorated. And as importantly, it's durable. So if you look at year two, three, and four, you, you've, you've got a good durable process. And today, in the last 16 years since the protocol was published, 
Many sites now are claiming over 50% of the patients are off of insulin for five years. So that's a very significant result that's improved over the course of time. And again, that wouldn't have been done without all the islet transplant groups across the world. So, but there are limitations, and the two major limitations uh, are the cell source. Uh, islets are not scalable, hence the, the, the reason for us using embryonic stem cells. And the, the immunosuppression drugs. The immunosuppression drugs uh, really uh, are only, um, let's say, applicable for the worst patients, the patients that are hypo unaware who are, or who have uh, severe hypo events. Uh, and I'll talk about PEC and CAP and PEC Direct. And, and this graph uh, or this slide really highlights a couple of issues. I talked about the GMP cell line. It's a very significant asset. We have an embryonic stem cell line that was derived under GMP conditions. The flaps highlight the fact that we can take two million cells and within a couple of weeks scale it up to two billion cells, multiple billion cells. We then, um, it was very similar to Jean's talk today as far as a process, except, and she had a better picture, I think, I liked her graph regarding the next one, because she had the branches of a tree, and the second, uh, the image in the center, really highlights the fact that we've developed a process to take, what's that? Oh, there's another one? We got all kinds of pointers here. <laughs> Great, thank you. There you go. So this, this highlights the same process, at, or a similar process Gene showed this morning. But in this case, rather than going down a neural lineage, what we're doing is through a stepwise process, every ball and stick re regards every two or three days of media, where we add different reagents to the media to take the cells to a certain decision. So we're trying to recapitulate in vivo. We've developed a 14-day process that recapitulates what happens in the course of development when you start with the egg and sperm and nine months later have an insulin-producing cell. In this case, we don't make insulin-producing cells. We have precursors. They're about 80% of the way there. Uh, and then we transplant those. So we have a 14-day process to scale, 14-day process to differentiate. So the two product concepts, this is the, the PEC and CAP. The device that we were using is called PEC and CAPTRA, or I'm sorry, in, the Encaptra device. And it, it, there's, it has to do a number of things. I'll take you through it, but vascularity is key. You can see the, va the vessels on the surface of the device, and it also limits the thickness or how far the cells can grow from the, the vessels. This device is exactly the same device, the same structure, same materials, except for one structural difference, and that's the pores. We've drilled pores in the device, and it allows for direct vascularization. And we'll take you through that. So this, again, is this PEC and CAP. This is the, the most advanced product that we have right now. It's PEC-01, it stands for PEC, uh, pancreatic endocrine cells. It's the same cell source in both of these products. And this highlights the device. And a little bit more about the device, uh, the requirements, it's got, it's biocompatible, biostable, it retains the grafts, and it's removable. In many respects, it's kind of like a high tech, we often use the, the, the tea bag analogy. The idea is we put the cells inside of the device, the, bag, the, the, the device is porous, so it, it allows the diffusion of glucose in and the diffusion of insulin out. It eliminates any cell-cell contact. That's absolutely critical from an immunological perspective. Uh, so it, include, it excludes host cells, the oxygen and nutrients are transported, vascularization is key on the surface of the device, and it's designed to protect, these, these are allogeneic cells, okay, so, and in type 1, we have to also protect from autoimmunity. So the device is designed to, and the porosity is key with respect to that. So this, um, this graphic, I want to highlight, this is, this is some mouse data, but it does show the vessels on the surface of the device. This is a braided structure that adds integrity. These are, these are standard, I shouldn't say standard, but uh, medical grade materials. That's an important aspect of this. Uh, again, a device that was made under GMP conditions. This is a cross section. You can see cells growing inside the device. Keep that in mind. I'll show you some, some images from patients in a second. And here's the vessels on the surface uh, of the device. This graph highlights the fact that the cells are making insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. So we are getting all the hormones that are in an islet. We believe that's very important from a counter-regulatory perspective. I throw this graphic in because I, I just want to show that we can cure rodents. We've done this thousands and thousands of times. Uh, and then had to, had to do over 600 animals in a GLP study before going in the clinic. These animals were made diabetic. You can appreciate this is uh, basically 100 is a normalization. And then the, the animals, their blood glucose, and this is with our human pancreatic cells. You can see they come down uh, to basically normal. They actually come down to the set point, the human set point, which is even lower than the rodent set point. And, uh, and then we take the cells out, and you can see they become diabetic again. 
So the clinical trial, uh, we uh, have two sites. One is with Bob Henry at the University of California at San Diego, and the second is with James Shapiro, the Edmonton Protocol uh, uh, leader. Uh, and um, our current focus is we have a phase one, two trial going. The, the current focus of the clinical trial is safety, like any phase one, but also engraftment. We want to optimize cell survival, cell differentiation, and the vascularity. Once that's optimized, we're going to go to the DSMB to move on to the cohort two. So again, it's a phase one, phase two. This speaks a little more to the design, so it's safety, tolerability, and efficacy. Um, again, this highlights the fact that we're looking at optimizing the surgical procedure. That's really, really important. We've learned a tremendous amount. We've done over 14 patients now, and with every patient we learn when it comes to the surgical procedure, different aspects of pre- and post-op uh, treatment, uh, different aspects of pharmacological intervention. And then um, I'll show you some data in a second. It's ongoing, and in a second, uh, the second cohort will be 36 patients, a dose-escalating trial. We're going to evaluate efficacy after six months. All of the patients, so getting back to the basic patient aspect of this, these patients are the real heroes in this story. They come in, they get multiple incisions, implants are put in, they're put on a continuous glucose monitor, they're monitored, they come in for regular bloods because we're looking immunologically whether we're seeing any sensitization. So they're just very engaged, very active patients in this clinical trial. Uh, all of the implants are going to be in for two years. So the... Um, this basically is what we're going to be measuring in the first cohort. Each patient receives six of these EN20 uh, devices. The 20 and 250 uh, is uh, representative of the volume, okay, the volume of cells that we're putting in. So each patient gets six of these and two of the larger devices. And then we harvest the small devices every several weeks. It depends on the patient and, and the study. And we evaluate basically the, the, all these issues. Are the cells viable? Are they surviving? Do we have good vascularity? And are they differentiating, similar to what we've seen in the rodents? The endpoints for the, phase, the cohort, the second cohort, safety and tolerance, is going to be insulin production in C-peptide, in that case, as a surrogate, and then also any reduction in insulin requirements or the frequency of hypo events. So uh, the, date, the data to date, this is a summary. We've had uh, no adverse re events related to the cells in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we have had, had uh, adverse events related to the surgery. Uh, and, but none of them have been significant. All of them have resolved. We've had no off-target tissue growth with the pluripotent cell. You're concerned that the cells could go in different directions and make mesoderm or ectoderm. We haven't seen anything except endodermal tissue. And as importantly, we've seen no evidence of allogeneic or auto uh, autoimmune rejection. So the device is working uh, with respect to the, the immunology. So relative to the picture I showed before, um, the rodent data, this is human data, and here's the cross-section. This is the, the, the porous device that's protecting the cells. This is tissue, this is artifact from sectioning. The next slide really shows the vascularity. You can see the, the bundles on the surface. Again, this is artifact, but those vessels were right up against that device, facilitated uh, survival. Again, this is a sentinel device, so this is one of the small devices that was taken out at 12 weeks. Here we show insulin. So again, do the cells differentiate like they did in rodents? The answer is yes. We, this marker is a key beta cell marker, and it co-expresses with insulin. And, and that's really key because we need certain, there's a number of key beta cell markers that we look for, and that co-expression is critical. Here's insulin, and this is 6.1, and here's insulin in, in 6.1. We've now started to actually take out some of the larger devices. So this is uh, a 250 that we've taken out, so it's 250 microliters. And you can see these clusters of cells. If you were to section a pancreas, this is exactly what an islet would look like. So we're getting morphologically a very similar cell to what we've seen, uh, what you see in the pancreas. Three out of the five vessel, uh, devices, we've seen good, um, good cell growth and so to date that we've, um, in the retrievals. So this really checks the boxes, and I've said all of these things, but the thing that's, that we're working on and continue to work on in cohort one is consistency. Like I said, we had three out of five. We didn't have five out of five. So we're seeing differences from patient to patient. We're seeing some differences even in the same patient. So we're looking at everything from location as far as a surgical procedure, different aspects of the size of the incision, the pocket. Again, you know, how we're treating the, the, um, uh, the incision, both pre-op and post-op. So there's multiple variables that we're actually, we continue to test in this first cohort. Once we're con uh, convinced it's consistent, then we're going to go to the DSMB and go on to cohort two. So in the course of this, there's been a lot of learnings. 
And so we've learned a lot from Peck and Cap. And we came, this concept really came about, there was some preclinical work where we perforated the device with larger holes and allowed direct vascularization. And in that case, you're not limited by diffusion before the vessels were on the surface. In this case, the vessels can actually dig into the device. So it was a combination of things. We had all the PEC and CAP data. We, we now had this preclinical data. And we, so we took a hard look at that unmet need with, with the Edmonton type patients, the patients that are hypo unaware, uh, that have brittle diabetes, and or patients that have kidney failure because they're already on, on um, uh, immunosuppression drugs. And there's a significant number of diabetics that have kidney failure. It's the leading cause of kidney failure. So we, um, this really highlights, I think, the, the device, the pores. Again, a specific number and size of pores. You can appreciate this is a thicker device. We have vessels now inside of the implant. But again, you're going to need an immunosuppression with this type of product. Uh, there's a potential for robust engraftment and potentially less dosing. Because in the case where we think we're going to need anywhere between four to six devices for the PEC and CAP, we may only need one to two devices because, again, we get that much more cell growth inside of the device. This is some rodent data, uh, again, that, you know, I think this is 25 weeks where we're showing very significant amounts of, of insulin uh, in a very difficult rodent model. So we took this information to the FDA uh, with a preclinical plan in February. They, um, we aligned very quickly on a, on a plan as far as GLP studies. We're in the midst of those studies as we speak. Our goal is actually uh, to file an IND, and this is going to be for that subset of patients that are hypo and aware or have uh, severe events, and it would be with immunosuppression. Uh, and our goal, and the, one of the big advantages was the discussion around orphan was very interesting today, either breakthrough therapy or orphan indication. There's about 10% of type 1s or about 150,000 type 1s that fall into that acute kind of population. So uh, there is the potential for that kind of designation, which also could allow for a more rapid development. So we're, we're very excited about this program and moving that forward. Just one other note about what we brought. So again, it was, uh, we worked on this within J&J &J for 10 years. We had an investment in, in Viasite. We decided, and this is basically the Viasite protocol shown here to make precursors, we did internally in J&J &J develop protocols to make more advanced cells, cells that make ins insulin a more rapid time. But we were three to four years away from the clinic. So we, this is a very innovative business deal. We actually shut down our program internally and we spun the program into Viasite. And the intent there is to bring basically all the technologies we can to really improve the probability of success. And it really allows for a portfolio of technologies to, to develop future products. And this just highlights some, some markers. This is a, a key uh, beta cell marker that we now found in, in vitro we could get with our new differentiation protocol and some data around uh, glucose responsiveness. And we get almost 50% of the cells expressing insulin in a dish. But again, this is a futuristic product. It could be a second or third generation product. But it gives Viasite, uh, again, a, a portfolio of technologies that are also aligned with a portfolio of patents. So the blue are the, the patents from Viasite, the green are the patents from, J and J, from Janssen, and that it's all under one protocol now. And, and as I said, we, had, we continue to have our, internal, our external investment in the company. And we have more IP around here. All together, by fusing the portfolio, we have over 75 US patents and 125 applications and, and uh, all told a, almost 1,000 US and foreign uh, either issued or, or filing. So a very significant patent portfolio. And this is just a summary. Uh, I think the one thing I did want to highlight on this slide, though, that's really key, is the funding. And the JDRF, uh, there was discussions before about different foundations, but clearly another way that patients play a significant role uh, with all those marches and dimes that they collect, uh, they fund programs like uh, the program here at Viasite. Uh, with, I think we've raised over 12 million, or they've provided over 12 million in funding over the years. CIRM also, you know, the state of California and the patients in the state of California have provided a significant amount of funding to, to uh, Viasite over the years. And we're extremely grateful for that. So with that, thank you very much.